I've asked him to do, do the song. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes I ask things that are uh, a little harder. I don't know if he knew this song before or not, uh, but he said he would do it for me. And so, Sonny, come and sing what the Lord's laid upon your heart.
the, uh, the children may be dismissed for junior church at this time. I'm going to go ahead and skip the introduction uh, this morning just because of time. But uh, just a reminder, we talked uh, last week about uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and how, how they uh, play into uh, salvation. And uh, obviously without God there would be no salvation. But uh, we talked uh, about the repentance a uh, week before that. And again, without repentance, there is no salvation. So I want to uh, continue on this uh, study of important ingredients uh, to salvation. For anyone, any person, um, all these have to play a part in salvation. So I want to look this morning at love. I'm talking about God's love. And uh, uh, go with me, and I, I'm not telling you to turn back there in your Bibles, but in your mind's eye, go with me uh, back to Genesis. And, and we, we know that uh, Adam and Eve, they lived in a perfect environment, and everything, uh, everything was, was perfect, literally, until they messed up, until they disobeyed God and sin entered into our perfect world, and, and then nothing would ever be the same since. And we know that today. I mean... We, as Pastor Randy was talking about, uh, this world in which we live is an absolute upside-down, wicked, crazy, sinful uh, place to be. That's the world in which we live right now. But, uh, uh, but here's what I want you to see, uh, again, concerning Adam and Eve. Um, listen, they messed up big time. We, we know that. We know that Adam and Eve messed up big time, and we're not pointing fingers back at them because if it was you and me back then, we would have messed up too. So, I, you know, it's, it's funny. I hear people say often, you know, wait till I see Adam or wait till I see Eve. And, you know, and I just say, wait, hold on there. Back down there a little bit, boy. Um, you know what? If it was you or if it was me, we would have done the same thing. So we can't blame them. But the fact of the matter is they messed up. And, um, and instead of God showing disgust and anger and judgment and, and revenge and retribution and just, you know, flicking them off the face of the earth like he could have, uh, he didn't do that. He didn't do that at all. He, uh, instead, he chose, yes, he did uh, choose to, uh, to chastise them and, uh, and inform them that their lives would never be the same as they were before, but his thoughts were always on love and compassion. Love and compassion towards Adam and Eve. Even in their disobedience, he still loved them. And then a few thousand years later, uh, that love would be shown in an absolutely incredible uh, way. And that, of course, was through the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole the whole world was so full of sin that God said, okay, son, it's time. It's time for you to go down and, 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 uh, as in the form of a human being, in the form of a man, and uh, it's time uh, for... God loved the world so much, John 3, 16. You know, we all know that verse. He loved the world so much that he, he gave to this world his only son, his only begotten son. And so we are the recipients of Jesus Christ coming down here. And, and again, he didn't condemn the world. He didn't condemn the world at all, but instead he made a way for anyone who wanted to be saved and who wants to be saved even today. God made a way for that. Matter of fact, the, uh, uh, the, the, the next verse, we know John 3, 16, well, John 3, 17, for God sent not his Son into the world to what? Condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. That's why Jesus Christ came into this world. It was because of God's love. It's because of Jesus' uh, obedience to the Father. And, and that's why he is still offering, all these years later, he's still offering salvation. If you're here uh, with us, among us today, or if you're here, or if, you, if you're there out in the internet land, um, and you're not saved, please listen, please listen to this message because God wants you to be saved and he's made every effort so that you could be saved. 
John, 1 John, rather, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10 says this, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son uh, to be the, now hold on here, to be the propitiation for our sins. What in the world is propitiation? I'll tell you what, I, you know, I've, I've got a, uh, a Bible dictionary along with a dictionary and you know, I keep all these books nearby. Any, any preacher would, uh, it does the same thing. And uh, so I looked in there, and there's this long, long definition in the Bible dictionary uh, of the word propitiation. But I like what I, I saw years ago or heard. I can't remember where I saw it, who I heard it from. But it was this. He said, the satisfaction, this is propitiation, the satisfaction of God by the death of Jesus Christ to meet the demands of God's judgment. Let me read that again. It's the satisfaction of God. God was satisfied that Jesus Christ, his death, would meet God's uh, demand. God was satisfied about that. And then someone else said, God was satisfied with the payment of your sin and my sin. God was satisfied with that. And in fact, you know what, I'm going to, I'll get back here. Hold on, let's, let's talk. God was satisfied with the payment of your sin. So guess what that means? You don't have to do anything to pay God for your payment. You don't have to try to appease God. You don't have to try to please God. You don't have to try to angle with God. Let's make a deal. No, you just have to believe that Jesus Christ already paid the payment for your sins. And God was satisfied with that. There is nothing you could ever, ever do to impress a God who is never impressed. I don't know if you ever thought about that before. God's never impressed. Not with you. I hate to break it to you. Not with anything you do. Sorry. God is not impressed. God was impressed with his son. And he did all that needed to be done. Because of God's love and Christ's payment for our sin... I read this someplace else. We're allowed because of, because, let me start over. Because of God's love and Christ's payment for our sin, we are allowed to stand before God's mercy seat instead of his judgment seat. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's good. I didn't make that up. Somebody else did, but that's good stuff. I'll tell you what, I don't know anyone not anyone in here, not anyone out there who is ever going to say, I mean, if they're mentally okay, who is ever going to say, no, you know what, I'd rather stand before God's judgment seat so I can explain to God, no, no. I want to stand before God's mercy seat and just fall flat on my face before him and thank him for loving me enough to send his only son, begotten son, for me and for you. You can say that about yourself, but I can say it about myself. I believe that if I was the only one on the face of this earth, God would send his son to die on the cross because of my sins and to pay the penalty for my sins. Romans 5.8 says simply this, but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, he didn't, he didn't and, and some people struggle with this, uh, God didn't wait for you or me to get a little better and a little better and a little better, and then he said, okay, now you've reached where I want you to reach, now I'm going to go ahead and send my son to die on the cross for you. That wasn't, that the, that wasn't the case at all. Because guess what? We can't do it. We can't get a little better and a little better and a little better. Um, God sent his son and demonstrated that his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
God's love. Number two, speaking of mercy seat, the next ingredient to salvation is mercy. Mercy. Uh, mercy is, is not giving someone what they deserve. Not giving someone what they deserve. I thought about that. The, dic the definition in the dictionary is this. Not inflicting harm when the person has a right to and, this is the important part, and they have the power to do it. Cornelius, I thought about you when I was doing this. And so here's my, here's my example. Everyone knows Cornelius. If Cornelius came up here and stood next to me, you would see that he is a bigger man than I am. And you would see that he could, if he wanted to, and I'm thankful that he doesn't, I hope he doesn't anyway, he could break me in two. Yeah. So if I kicked Cornelius in the shin out in the parking lot, he could come in here and break me in two. But you know what? I call upon his mercy. He has the right, he would have the right to break me in two. And the best part about that, it says, and they have the power to do it. He would have the power to do it. But I would call on his mercy. And he would say, oh, okay, Brother Russ. I won't kill you this time, but next time. No, you know what? So that's mercy. That is mercy. Yes, I hope. I hope. That's mercy. Listen, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 says this, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his what? Mercy. According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to cut that off, but I, the focus here is on the first part of that, uh, not by works of righteousness, there is not a thing you can do, as I already said, to impress God. Nothing. And make no mistake about it. People believe that. People believe, I've got to do something so incredible that God is going to be so impressed that he's going to let me into his heaven. It's never going to work. Never has worked. Isn't working now. Never going to work. We need his mercy. I'm sure you'll remember that the, about the two blind men in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. They did not cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have judgment upon us. That was not, that's not what they did. Jesus, thou son of God, have what? Mercy. Have mercy upon us. You know what, folks? God has the right and he has the power, according to that definition we read a moment ago, to flick any one of us off the face of the earth anytime he wants. Anytime. He has the right and he has the power. There's not a thing you can do to stop it except to call on his mercy. Lord, please, I, I, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've repented of my sins. I'm, I'm calling on you, Father, to show mercy upon me. Little old me, little old human being me. Lord, don't flick me off the face of the earth. Give me mercy. And God, being God, is always, always ready, willing, and able to extend mercy it's Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a great psalm. Psalm 51 is when David, who had committed adultery and then tried to cover it up, oh, with just murder. Now David is confessing his sin before God. And the very, we're not going to go there, but uh, Ken, if you want to, but I'm not going there. I've already written down what I want to write down. The very first verse says, David saying to God, Have mercy upon me, O God. Lord, have mercy upon me. David knew that he had committed a, a terrible sin, multiple sins, and now he's confessing his sin to God, and that's what God wants, uh, for us to confess our sin, to repent of our sin, 
and plead, <clears throat> plead for mercy. That's what God wants, and that's what God is, is always willing to do. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at, we looked at uh, what I said was a coin, faith on one side and repentance on the other side. And, and so that's a, that's a perfect picture of a coin. Well, there's another coin here today. And this coin today is mercy on one side and grace on the other side. Grace on the other side. Uh, again, mercy is, is uh, you know, not giving someone uh, something that they deserved. Well, grace is the, the flip side of that. Grace is giving someone what they don't deserve. Mercy, withholding from something that they do deserve. Grace, giving something that we don't deserve. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Without God's grace, we'd all be doomed. Just like without his mercy, without his love, without God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we would all, all be doomed, um, but for by grace are you saved. And by the way, not of works. I, 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 could, I could stay there for about a week. Not of works. You can't do anything. How many times have I said you can't do anything to impress God? God looks at our works before we get saved. God looks at our works as a filthy, uh, just a, a pile of filthy, disgusting, dirty rags. So if you're trying to get to heaven by doing good works, that's what God sees, a pile of filthy rags. So we've got God's love. We have the coin, mercy and grace. And by the way, Webster's Dictionary says of grace, it is the divine favor toward man as distinguished from God's justice. Just like those two blind men did not say, uh, thou son of David, you know, have judgment upon us. <laughs> we also don't want God's justice. We want God's grace. We need God's grace. We plead for God's grace. As a, as a sinful human being, you know, which would you prefer, <laughs> justice or grace? Uh, that's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, would you prefer to pay the penalty for your own sins or accept what Jesus Christ did on the cross in paying for your penalties? Again, a no-brainer. Everyone would have to say, I much rather, I prefer Jesus paying the penalty for my sin. If you're here this morning, you're, on, you're watching, if you haven't gotten saved yet, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Take God's mercy that he offers you. Take God's grace that he offers you. Um, uh, many of the Apostle Paul's epistles start or end with grace be unto you or, or grace, mercy, and peace. And uh, I, I, I love that. It's, a, it's a, the beginning or the end of most of his or many of his epistles. And, and listen to... <clears throat> listen to... Uh, the fourth verse of grace greater than our sin. The, the, the song says, uh, Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face. Now listen, will you this moment his grace receive? What, what in the world would hold you back from receiving God's grace and God's mercy and God's love. The song goes on to say, Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all of our sin. That's God's grace, folks. So we have God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, and finally, I want to look at for a few moments God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness. I, I wish we could stay here for at least a couple of days um, because forgiveness is found throughout the entire Bible. There is forgiveness found throughout the entire Bible. God has always forgiven 
repentant sinners. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If that person is repenting of their sins and asking God to forgive them and asking Jesus Christ to be their Savior, God will save them. God is always, always willing to forgive repentant sinners. And, and he did, again, at the very beginning of creation with Adam and Eve. He's still doing that today. And I'm just going to throw this out at no extra charge. Think about that the next time you don't forgive someone. God has forgiven you and forgiven me sometimes just horrible things. But those horrible things are the things that we have made up because we make up lists. You know, we've got this, this horrible list over here and we've got this other list over here that aren't, isn't so bad of sins. Yeah, and if somebody sins against us, how, how quick are we to forgive them the way God forgave you and the way God forgave me when we repented of our sins and when we called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and begged God to forgive us? And, and he did. He did. Not, you know what, let me think about this and uh, go back and, and come back to me next week and let's see how you're doing then. Uh-uh. <laughs> no. God forgives every time somebody, a, a, a sinner, a, an unsaved sinner, there's only two kinds of sinners, there's saved sinners, we talk about that in Sunday school, an unsaved sinner. And whenever an, an unsaved sinner calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and repents of their sins, God does not have to take it to the board. He doesn't have to mull it over. He just says, okay, I've forgiven you. I've saved you now. Now, what are you going to do about it? Well, I want us to look. I, I tell you what, I tossed and I really, really struggled with a, an example, an illustration in the Word of God. There's so many. And then I boiled it down to two, and then I thought, oh, both of these are great. Which one do I? And I, I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't know which one. And finally, you know, I just, I said, all right, Lord, if you want me to, if you want me to, to do this one, then, uh, you know, just help me in my own mind and my heart to know this is the one to do it. And uh, you know what? I didn't see a sign in heaven, but this is what you're getting this morning. <laughs> I can't tell you this is what God wanted me to do. I don't know because I struggled. Even this morning, I still struggle with it because the other one is just as powerful as this one. But here, you're going to get this one this morning. John chapter 8, and I am going to go there. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to get out my... I'm going to get out one of these two pairs of glasses. Which one is it? I don't know. This one. I'm going to get out these glasses so I can read John chapter 8, starting in verse number 1. The Bible says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, picture that. Picture that poor woman being thrown in the midst of a group of hypocritical men. They say unto him, Master, huh, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they, may, that they might uh, have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And by the way, let me just interrupt myself for one second. Every time we read this, every time I read this anyway, the thought is always, now, correct me if I'm wrong, the last I knew, if someone was taken in adultery, there was probably a second person there. 
Nothing is mentioned here about the man. Nothing. There, you got that for no extra charge. Now let me go on, because that's really got nothing to do with my message. Verse number 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And I've always, I've always thought, wondered what he wrote on the ground. Did he, write, did he write the sins of the people that were accusing her? Did he write their sins on the ground? I don't know. But verse 8 says, And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Now here's where it gets good. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Now get this, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Now, the only one in that whole group of probably all men, the only one in that group that had a right to condemn her didn't. The only one that had a right to con uh, condemn her did not. Jesus, listen to this now, Jesus did not condone what she did, but neither did he condemn her. Instead, he forgave her. He forgave her. And then the greatest part of this, this story, Jesus ends this, this unplanned meeting, unplanned on, on her part anyway. Everything Jesus did was planned. <clears throat> and he tells her, go and sin no more. Don't misunderstand. Again, don't misunderstand this because when a person gets saved, God does not tell us nor expect us to not ever sin again. <clears throat> Is there anyone here this morning that got saved and you haven't sinned since then? No, I didn't, I didn't, I know my hand's up, I'm just using it as an example. None of us in here, when you got saved, when I got saved, it didn't take long <laughs> to find out and God remind us, <clears throat> you're saved, but you're now a saved sinner. Because that old flesh that you live in, that's going to cause you to sin from now until the day you die. Now, God's not satisfied with that. I want to throw that out there, too. Don't, don't assume on God's grace and mercy and forgiveness and all that. But um, that's simply impossible for, for us to go through life. Uh, imagine, if you would, imagine right now <clears throat> your attitudes, your actions your thoughts, your words being perfect 24-7. Ain't, ain't happening. No, not anybody. Not, not all those things, not your words, your thoughts, your actions, your attitude. Uh, any 24-hour any period. If you get through from midnight to midnight, call me at one minute after midnight and tell me about the wonderful day that you had that you did not sin. And then I want you to explain it to me so I can lie the next week in church. No, when Jesus told her, sin no more, listen to this now. He was telling her, and you and me, to leave that sinful lifestyle that you led before you got saved, before I got saved. That's what he was telling her. Leave that, new, leave that old lifestyle behind and begin that new life with, with God as the driving force behind it. That's what God wants. He wants us to leave that stuff behind. Listen, this is a verse that, 
that we're, I'm going to share in just a moment. But this is a verse that we, we say quite often around here. But listen, it's powerful, it's true, it's challenging, it's encouraging. What verse is that? Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. She's a new creature or a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'll tell you right now, if anyone in here or out there, you, you prayed a prayer and you asked God to forgive you and you, you got up and, and nothing has changed in your life, I hate to break it to you, but you're not saved. I'm not judging. The Word of God says if anyone be in Christ, he or she is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, if, if you can't see things in your own life that God has been changing in your life, and it takes time. It does. It takes time. But after years, and you don't see anything different, you're the same person you were before, you better get back to God. For the first time in our lives, God's love and God's grace and and God's mercy and God's forgiveness, we experience that, and a change has to happen in the person's life. If you've never repented of your sins and, and never experienced God's, those things I just mentioned, love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness, you're, you're still lost, and you need to be saved. And, and, if, and if you die today in that condition, you would never, ever see God's heaven, ever, See God's heaven if you died in that condition. And you'll spend all of eternity asking yourself, why in the world? I'll tell you right now, there are people in hell today who heard the word of God and rejected the word of God. And for, think about that for all of eternity, asking themselves, why didn't I get saved? I had an opportunity to get saved, and I chose not to get saved. I can't think of a better day to get saved than today. If you're here or out there and you're not saved, just bow the knee to God and get saved. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and repent of your sin and, and ask God for his love and mercy and grace and forgiveness. And he'll give it to you willingly. He'll give it to you willingly. Trust Jesus as your Savior today. Why not change that if you're unsaved? Why not change that today? You'll never regret it. You'll never, ever regret getting saved. I promise you. If years from now, you say, you know what, I regret it. You come back to me and tell me about it, and I'll give you your money back. That's a fact. You'll never regret getting saved. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? I know I'm speaking to many people, most people that know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and, and I get that. But I also know there's a chance that maybe somebody in this room right now will say, Pastor Russ, I, <clears throat> I'm not saved, and I know I'm not saved, and I want to be saved. I mean, let's just put it as simple as possible. You say, I'm not saved, and I want to be saved. If that's your testimony, if that's your experience right now, your testimony, just slip your hand up and right back down. I'll see your hand, and I'll pray for you. I promise. I, you, I say this every week. I would never call upon anyone who slipped their hand up and said, Pastor Russ, please pray for me. I'm not saved, but I want to get saved. Anybody all over the auditorium. I'm not saved. I want to be saved today. Say, Pastor Russ, would you please pray for me? I'm, I'm saved. I know the Lord is my Savior, but I've been struggling with some things right now in my life. You know, whatever it might be, unfaithfulness or anger or finances or whatever it might be. Say, would you please pray for me? Just slip your hand up again. I'll, thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Hands all over the auditorium. Join me in prayer. Father, we come before you now thanking you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the power in your word, the truth of your word. And Lord, we think of some that still may be here this morning and may be out there in the internet land and 
they've never come to Christ. They've never really, they've never really called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and asked for forgiveness and asked for salvation. And so, Lord, I pray that that would happen today. And, Father, for those, uh, many hands went up, but I'm sure there were others that just didn't raise their hand that are struggling with some issues in their life right now. They need you. They need to experience more uh, of your forgiveness and, uh, or, or whatever it might be, your, your grace or mercy, whatever it might be. God, I just pray that you would meet their needs where, where they're having them. Bless our time, Father. Thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. I ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Forgiveness, what a wonderful blessing that is for both unsaved, because that's the only way of salvation, is Amen. through Jesus Christ. But also for us as saved, we Amen. can come to him knowing that his arms are still open. He will not reject us. He will continue to forgive us, continue to love us. If you will, take your, bi take your Bibles, take your hymnals to 201. Pastor Russ made a, um, uh, made, quoted this, this, um, this song. We're going to sing the first and fourth, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. If the Lord's spoken to your heart today and you need prayer, you need uh, the Lord to work in your heart today in a mighty way, come down and join Pastor Russ. I know that uh, he'll pray with you. Um, I'm going to come down. I'll pray with you. Um, but uh, if the Lord has spoken to your heart and you want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're out there in, in the Internet, you know, watching us either now or later on today, and you need somebody to explain something, email me, uh, rfriedman at northchesterbaptist.net. Uh, give me a call, and you can uh, find us online, our phone number. Uh, but we want to make sure that you know for sure that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We want to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. Let's sing on the first and fourth. As we sing, I invite you to come down to the altar if you need to. judging Jesus said to the adulterous woman I'm not here to condemn we're not here to condemn if you need to come to the altar to pray if you need to come to the altar to get something right with the Lord please do so today before you leave let's sing on the fourth Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your marvelous grace, your infinite grace. Lord, as Pastor Russ beautifully put it, Lord, grace and mercy go hand in hand. You gave us what, uh, you didn't give us what we deserved and you withheld, um, you, uh, you withheld what we did deserve. And Lord, I thank you for that. 
I thank you for your love. I thank you for your care. I thank you for your ministry that you've bestowed upon us. Lord, now as we leave this place, go before us, challenge us, and use us that we may have an impact on the society around us. We do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.